Okay. Um, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are master's students? I think you all are. Really. Good, good, good. Okay, good. Um, just a couple of words of explanation. This is a very unique course. It's a very unusual course. And it's given by a very unique and unusual and very interesting people. One of whom is Andrew Trigel, or Tridge, as he's best known over here. Other, other of whom is Bob Edwards, who many of you probably have met already um, through interaction with the technical support group here in the uh, School of Computer Science. Um, free and open source software is a fascinating and it's a topic which really is not generally taught of itself, and it certainly is not taught this way. Uh, what you'll experience over the next um, four days and with the follow-up sessions thereafter is a hands-on approach to engaging with free and open source software projects. It's a very exciting um, adventure, I think, in education. And in the wrong hands, it would be very risky. But the hands that uh, you will experience with um, uh, Trinch and Bob are uh, second to none. They're people who I find to be inspirational, very inspirational in my interaction with them. Depth of knowledge, depth of enthusiasm, which is unequal in this area. And I think that uh, you're in for a great experience. And so I just wanted to say, this is really interesting, this is really unusual. Keep your minds open, please. Work very hard. And I think that you will experience something which you will not be able to have encountered at other universities. So this is the first time this course has been given, and uh, I think you're in for something pretty special. Anyway, um, uh, I wish you all the best of luck, and I wish the lecturers the best of luck, and um, uh, um, there you have it. Okay, well, welcome. Um, so there's a handout over here, in case of you haven't seen it, on the lab setup. Uh, Bob's printed those off. Uh, so you'll be working a lot, as Henry mentioned, it's a very practically oriented course. Um, so we'll be working a lot in the, uh, in the lab in there, in 115, 116. We may end up doing some of the lectures in there as well. We were sort of a bit undecided as to whether it was better doing lectures in here or in the, in the lab room. So we can do it neither. If you have a preference and if you think it would work better doing the lectures in there, then, you know, say so. Um, as Henry mentioned, this course is a bit of an experiment. So just hand those around. Uh, course is a bit of an experiment. And so we're looking for feedback from you on exactly how, how to improve it. And that, those improvements may well come during the course if you've got comments like that, like where to have the lectures or what material to include. So the, this first lecture is just to give you a basic overview of what free and open source software is all about. Um, how it works, um, how many people are involved, uh, what types of things uh, people do with free and open source software. I'm hoping that you've all got a bit of an idea already. Because um, has everyone here read the background reading material that I sent out? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, everyone read that? Great. Okay. Did you find it illuminating, confusing, terrifying? How did you find it? Illuminating. Illuminating. Okay, good. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, everyone found that way found it useful. Um, some of it may involve a bit of jargon that you may not have understood. Hopefully that jargon will become a bit clearer uh, during this course. And um, the background material was designed to give you a bit of an idea of some of the core philosophical ideas behind free and open source software. There's, um, this course is really covering both the, the theory and the philosophy behind FOSS plus the practical side. And some of the practical side will come out in the lectures, but some of that practical side will also be in the um, lab work that we're going to be doing in the in 115-116. Okay, but just to get started, what is free and open source software? Well, um, the first thing, what's free? And this has led to a lot of discussions within the free software community, exactly what free means. And the, the free and free software, what do you see as being, as being free? I mean, um, if you hear the term free software in general speech in English, what, what would you hear? Anyone? I'm expecting, by the way, that the, the students in this class don't just sit there dumbly and do nothing. I'm expecting you to contribute. There's no cost. No cost? Okay. So that's generally, often people do hear the word free and just think low, no cost. 
But um, free has another meaning as well. What's the other meaning? Freedom. 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 Right. So which type of free are we referring to with free software? Freedom. Freedom. Okay, that's right. So that's generally what's referred to, though usually there's an implication of no cost as well. Okay. So does providing source make it open source? This course is about free and open source software, and we'll be looking at some of the subtle distinctions between the two later on in the course. Does providing source code make a piece of software open source? No. No? no. Why not? Because it depends on the license that the source code is provided to you, I think. Right. So can anyone think of an example where source code is provided, but it's not open source software? The license you says you can't modify it or do anything with it. Right, okay, any examples of that? Uh, some of the template libraries that come with the Microsoft development packages. Yep, yep, there's some other good ones as well. Um, that you can, for example, if you're at a university, you can get the source code license to Microsoft Windows, to the kernel. Right, it's perfectly possible. But it's not open source software, right? Even though you can see the, the full source code for the operating system, you are under restrictions in how you can deal with that source code with other people. And so open source, uh, it's often capitalised, you can see I've capitalised it here, it has a very specific meaning. And one of the documents that I asked you to read in the background reading before this lecture was a document called the Open Source De Definition. And we're going to be looking in a bit more detail at the Open Source Definition later on in this, uh, in this lecture. Okay, so who makes FOSS? Who here has made some FOSS for a start? Who's, who's contributed? Okay, we've got Michael and Bob, anyone else contributed to free software? Right, so who does it? Who do you think makes it? Apart from it, it's not all made by Michael and Bob, right? They do a remarkable amount. I've done a little bit as well. Uh, but who do you think does it? And, and why do they do it? Pretty much anyone. Pretty much anyone? Yeah? yeah you guys? But any, any other? Interest. Interest? Yeah. yeah, just as a hobby? Yeah, a lot of yeah. commercial companies. A lot of commercial companies? So why do commercial companies develop free software? Um, one of them is it allows them to contribute jointly contribute to a project and everybody gets the benefits, such as like GCC, a lot of the um, manufacturers of chips or whatever may contrib contribute to GCC and right. get the benefit. Okay, but you're, you're, contrib you're attributing there some fairly altruistic motives to those companies. Now, are companies known for their altruism? No. Right, so why do you think they're doing it anyway? Works out cheaper. <coughs> Works out, how does it work out cheaper? Because instead of just paying developers to do their bit, they're also giving the benefits of all the other development that's going on in parallel. Excellent. Okay. Now, what, would it matter whether the license on the software allowed the other com one of those companies to hoard the changes they make to themselves? Well, that, that would depend on what the uh, motive of the company that was hoarding the changes was. Right, yes. I mean, if they were only for something they were only going to use, they might hoard those changes yep. and keep it proprietary. Right. Uh, but for something that's going to be the base upon which other companies may build upon, then yep. they want to share it so that it's, uh, so that, that, that shared component is um, distributed in the development. Exactly, exactly. And these are exactly the sort of discussions that are going on in boardrooms in companies all over the world. Right? Trying to work out exactly how they're going to interact with the free software community. And I've got a, there's a whole lecture on that, FOSS and Business, um, later in the week. We'll go into it in a lot more detail. But I do want you to think a little bit while we're going through this course about the different motivations of different people, different users of free software. Okay, so is FOSS just for, for fanatics and hobbyists? That's often an accusation that, that was made, particularly um, in, say, the, the mid to late 90s. Uh, people just accused FOSS of only being for fanatics and hobbyists. Is that true? No, why isn't it true? Because you need to use it as well. Okay, and we're not fanatics and hobbyists? Oh, I think some of us are pretty fanatical. Yes, I hope so. We should be fanatical if we're not. So, yeah, so that sort of method being just for fanatics and hobbyists was used as a, as a slight against free software uh, quite commonly, as I said, in the sort of mid-90s and late-90s. And it's really gone away since companies, uh, multi-billion dollar companies, have started using it in a big way, and it's become a very large part of the software ecosystem. So um, that whole sort of meme has really gone away these days. Okay, can you make money with FOSS? Um, so yes, you can provide support to various organisations. Okay, you can provide support to organisations, yes. Um, and, and can you think of anyone who does that? Um, IBM. IBM, yes indeed. Uh, anyone else? Uh, 
Sorry? All most of the Linux distributions. Uh, yep, most of them provide support. Yep, yep. Anyone can remember the, the original company, one of the uh, first companies to provide commercial support for free software? Anyone happen to vote? That was quite a late one, actually. It was a much earlier one. Okay. Even earlier than that. The one that really started the whole bandwagon and discovered the provide support for free software business model. You know, I think of that is you might have run across it in some of the documents I mentioned. EA not, apps. Sorry. The EA apps. EA. No, I think it, what I'm thinking of is Cygnus. Um, they really did a remarkable thing, and it was on a project that was already been mentioned here. That I think Dave mentioned, which is GCC, um, the the compiler, and that's where they really got their start doing support for the GCC compiler, and they started an incredibly successful business model. And um, there was there was a lot of very skeptical people at the time. A lot of people around Silicon Valley. Uh, assured them they were doomed to fail. There's no way you could make a business out of it. And they made an incredibly successful business out of it. And since then, many companies have followed after them and have made a very successful business out of that business model. There's lots of other business, business models for FOMS. There's lots of companies making a lot of money. The market's worth many billions of dollars a year now, probably tens or uh, billions of dollars a year. It's a bit hard to uh, measure it. Um, but uh, it is quite large. And the various business models, there's five broad business models that we'll be going through in, in some detail um, in the one of the later lectures, the one on FOSS and business. Okay, so does FOSS make for better software? And does it matter? <coughs> does FOSS, do, is the software necessarily better if it's FOSS? Not it's a simple question. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Is that always true? Is, 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 is so, the FOSS software sometimes better because it's FOSS? Probably not worse. Probably not worse. Yeah, it sort of varies. I mean, the one of the things that I, I would like you to understand is that FOSS is not a panacea. Making something a free software project doesn't necessarily make it a better piece of software. And for many people, it just doesn't matter. Because for many people developing free software, they're not doing it in order to make a piece of better software. They're doing it because they believe that free software is the right thing to do. And that's those who take a more ethical stance on free software. But there are other people who uh, treat free software techniques as an engineering technique that aims to make for better software. And certainly many of the techniques that are used in FOSS can lead to better software, but not necessarily in every case. So you need to understand there's a bit of a balance there. Free software, people do it for different reasons. And some of those reasons are related to software quality. But for other people, the reasons may be completely different. It may be just that they enjoy it more or that um, they think that there is an ethical imperative to creating free software. My own leanings tend to be more to the ethical side. So I should explain that although Henry mentioned that I've had a bit of background in free software, that background also means that I have some biases. And those biases, while I've tried to cover all the different views on free software in the lectures that I've prepared, those biases are bound to come through at, at some point. So I might as well tell you what they are. I tend to be one that leans towards the free software rather than the open source camp in my, my own dealings with the free software community. And I tend to lean more towards the ethical reasons for developing free software. But I understand the other reasons. And the companies that I've worked for over the past few years have tended to lean in the other direction. Right? They tend to care more about the business side, about the quality side, about other aspects, not about the ethics. So hopefully I'll be able to present a fairly balanced view for you, um, but uh, you should know that my background is more on the doing free software because it's, it's ethically the right thing to do. And we'll discuss some of the ethics a bit more in later lectures. Okay, so the many facets of FOSS. So FOSS is different things to different people. Um, some people just see free software as being a resource. Can you think who that might be? Can we think of it as being like, you know, uh, bauxite in the ground, or iron ore, or something like that. Who sees free software as being a resource? Some of the companies producing things like uh, embedded routers, that kind of thing. Just yep, easy exactly. To... Okay, so if you've ever got a little router or a switch, you see there's some little devices down in the corner here. I don't know if any of them are running free software. Uh, the makers of little devices like this. I think I've got my little, this, right, Sony. Okay, Sony makes this little electronic book reader. Lovely little book reading device, great thing. Right? This is based on free software. This is running a Linux kernel, it's running a whole lot of free tools on top of it, and you can have a look at that soft software, they release the, the packages underneath it. But Sony um, treated free software in this case as a resource. In what way was it a resource to them? 
how does it benefit Sony to use free software in a device like this? I mean, Sony is out there to make money, right? Sony's business. So why did they base this little device on free software rather than on some proprietary operating system? It reduces their cost. Reduces their time to market, reduces their costs, exactly. Um, it's cheaper for them to base it on a free operating system. Why? Why is that? There's more than one reason. No licensing fee per device. Right? There's no royalties, there's no per copy fee. They don't have to pay X many dollars per copy. So as they sell more devices, they've got a base cost of modifying the system to suit this device. But that, that base cost can be spread out across all the, uh, the readers they sell. And they sell a lot, a lot of these things. So if they had to pay $20 a unit, that would add up to a lot when they're selling, you know, I don't know how many millions of these things they sell, but certainly quite a few. Right, the same with a lot of little devices like this. Okay, so those companies like that treat free software as a resource. Um, some people see it as an ethical choice. In what way is free software an ethical choice? And who would see it as that way? I've already told you that I do. Knowledge should be shared. Knowledge should be shared, yes. Um, there's a common meme sort of um, information wants to be free, knowledge should be shared, these sort of catchphrases. Anything a bit more in depth than that? Think a bit more deeply about that. What, what's the ethical choice? What's the alternative ethical choice? All of the power being, uh, of the knowledge being concentrated in a few companies. Yeah, yeah. And like if um, they would tend to merge into like big monopolies and then you would have, um, uh, because there's power with the information, all the power tend to be centralised rather than distributed. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. But it, there's, there's a sort of starker ethical choice. Does anyone, have anyone read the story of what happened with the Richard Stallman and the printer? <coughs> the printer that sort of started it all? Anyone read that story? No? Okay. Well, there was this, um, at the MIT uh, AI lab, where Richard was working, there was a printer. And originally they had a printer that, where the software that drive the printer uh, was available freely from the manufacturer. Right? And they made lots of modifications to the software on that printer. And uh, they, they improved the software of that printer and then when somebody else in a different uh, computer science uh, lab somewhere else in the world had the same printer, they would share the improvements. Right? Then what happened? What do you think happened? Well, what happened was the maker of those printers decided that in future the software will be proprietary. And they they made you sign a contract when you bought the printer to say that you wouldn't share any improvements with anyone else. They forced you to not share those improvements. Okay. Now that means that here you have some improvements to a piece of software that would make other people's lives easier and you are prevented from helping others with those improvements. All right. So that's a, you are prevented from helping your neighbour and there's a strong ethical um, drive in humans to uh, help other people, right? It's sort of the default. If, you, if you've got no reason to not help them, you should help them, right? There's a, a strong piece of ethics behind that. But that's really the ethics behind Richard's original uh, ideas in free software. And those ethics where he wants to be able to help neighbours. And in particular, he wants to ensure that um, the licences that are used on software allow people to help each other. In some cases, the licenses even require people to help each other, prevent you from keeping the changes to yourself. And we'll go that, through that in more detail on different cost licenses in the, the licensing lecture later in the week. Okay, so some see FOSS as being a technical choice. Andrew, could you, yeah? could you um, talk about the alternative ethical um, uh, position as well? Okay, the alternative ethical position is really summed up by a letter that Bill Gates wrote. And um, this was at the time when there was a um, there was a computer club. The I forgot the name of the computer club. It was a it was a um, micro PC hobbyist computer club. And um, this computer club was uh, had rampant sharing of the software involved. Right? They they shared um, copies of uh, various implementations of Basic. They shared copies of implementations of um, uh, the operating system kernels. Very simple though they were. And they had this computer club where they all met and shared the software. That was the norm at the time. This was in the mid-70s, right? Now, 
At that time, the first pieces of proprietary software were starting to come out. And those first pieces of proprietary software um, had licenses that says you can't share the software with other people. But this club tends to share the software anyway, right? And Bill Gates wrote a very annoyed letter, because he was the author of one of those pieces of software, a, a basic interpreter. A very annoyed letter, um, an open letter, basically saying that he thought that it was unethical people sharing the software with each other, because um, he thought that the people who wrote the software deserved to be able to make a living from it. All right. Now, those two positions, the sharing with your neighbour and the um, don't share software, can they actually be reconciled? Well, we've shown in certain business models you can still make a living, but you're yep. forcing one business model out. You can't say, yeah, you're kind of saying, well, you've got to use other business models in order to maintain this freedom. Right. The, the thing I was actually trying to get at, that's perfectly true, but the thing I was actually trying to get at was that there's a third ethical position which is extremely common in the free software community. And that third ethical position is that um, the author should be able to decide what happens with their work. Right? So if Bill Gates decides that he's going to put a proprietary license on his copy of some basic interpreter, then people should respect that and not copy the work. But if a free software author decides that he wants to release his software under a free license and wants to encourage sharing with neighbours, that should be allowed too. Now that seems very, very obvious. But of those three ethical positions, the two more extreme ones actually dominated for quite a while. For a long time, uh, Microsoft and Bill Gates proclaimed that free software, well they first of all accused it of being anti-American, which didn't really worry me at all. Right? I'm not particularly American myself. Um, also, they accused it of being um, communist, right? Which at the time had a much heavier sting than it does today, right? And they accused it of being um, well, all sorts of things, all sorts of uh, a cancer as well, which is a little harder to reconcile exactly how it's a cancer. Um, the answer to that in the free software community, turning around criticisms is, is quite common. The answer, you often see Microsoft represented as being like the Borg, in um, Star Trek, you've probably have you seen the Borg in Star Trek. You've all seen a Star Trek movie, surely. Yeah, you've seen the Borg. Okay, what does the Borg do? Assimilates, right? People often say Microsoft is like the Borg; they're assimilating. Well, actually, many people in the free software community proudly say we're like the Borg. We're going to, we're going to assimilate you, all right? We turn it around, and in many ways, the licensing practices of the free software community are like the Borg. They do try and assimilate. They do try and wheedle their way into other parts of the world, right? Where the price for using the software is that you have to follow these particular rules which tends to spread the license, right? It is a viral type of license. Well, you'll understand that a little better when I talk more about the GNU GPL license in later lectures. So anyway, we've sort of got three ethical positions there. One which says that um, everything, sh software should be shared, you should always share with your neighbour, and it is an ethical violation not to share with your neighbour, a neighbour, regardless of what the author wanted to happen to that work. Another ethical position is that you shouldn't ever share with your neighbour because you are preventing people from being able to make their living out of software. Right? Even if you produce the software yourself, if you give it away, that might hurt somebody else's business. Right? And the third ethical position is the author should be able to choose. Okay? So they're fairly common positions and you'll see all three positions represented when you look at various free software projects. Um, so you need to keep those in mind. Is that a bit clearer? Well, I think the, the position about the author being allowed to choose becomes uh, more um, robust when you consider within the framework of an industry of the company. So the company, yep. the company has invested a lot of money right. in employing people and the people get their livelihood out of developing the software. And then the company has an alternative business model, so it wants to hang on to that because it's invested a lot of money. Right. Right. Then it makes a profit, then it reinvests the profit in research. And right. Doing right. things which are unusual perhaps right. the that, art. It's, it, that's often said that the, the same justification can also be then used to sort of to apply for patents and those have other ethical concerns. You need to be a little bit careful in, in some of these justifications and how they apply the particular case of software. Um, what is unique about software? What is it that's strange about software compared to other industries? I've got a piece of software here in my hand. What's strange about it? You can duplicate it at essentially zero cost. 
duplication and distribution is sent to zero cost. And that does change some of the concepts around property, right? Uh, so it is important to keep those types of things in mind. There's, um, so actually we might, we might move off the ethics just at the moment, just because we're having a whole lecture that covers ethical choices and licenses and things later. But uh, I do want you to keep in mind those, those sort of ethical positions that are quite common. Um, one minor thing I would like to say about Henry's comments though, Henry was talking from the point of view of a company writing software. And that is a very common perspective in the commercial software industry, to think always in terms of companies. In the free software world, it tends to be author's rights as an individual programmer that is most respected, not companies. And you'll notice this, when you look at a piece of free software, what is highlighted is the individual developers, not the company they work for. Right? It tends to be a community that emphasises the, the rights of individuals as opposed to the rights of companies. Okay? And that's, that's quite important in how people deal with other organisations. Even if the software keep, comes out of a large company and it's free software, usually there is a strong association between the programmers themselves, the people who typed in the lines of code, and the users. Whereas in proprietary software, you tend to have a great deal of distance there. And the company presents a facade which isolates the programmers from the community of users. So uh, remember that when dealing with the, the, the free software community, you tend to have a much closer relationship with the developers than you would in the proprietary software world. Okay, so some see free software as a technical choice. In what way is FOSS a technical choice? You have a greater opportunities to see how something is working. Right. To understand it more fully than you would in a, in a closed source sense. Yes. Have any of you read the uh, Cathedral and Bazaar paper? Or in some of the papers, the Homesteading the New Sphere paper? Yep. Um, so it talks there about, uh, I think that one's in both those papers, about Linus's Law, as it's called by Eric Raymond. Uh, this actually predates the stuff that Linus did, but uh, it's often, often referred to by that name. Um, the, the law is that, you know, if you have enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. What does that mean in terms of a technical choice in free software? If you have enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. In theory, it means that if lots and lots of people are looking at the source code, there's an excellent chance that they'll pick up anything that's wrong. Right. And that, that's a common uh, theme in the free software community, that the free software community allows a lot more people to look at the source code and so have the possibility of finding the bugs. Now, it doesn't always work. Just because you have a million people looking at a piece of software, you can sometimes find that everyone thinks that somebody else is going to look for that particular type of bug, so nobody does. Sometimes that happens, right? But there is also a lot of truth to it. There is a lot more opportunity in the free software world for more people to find bugs. And if more people can find and report those bugs, then what happens? The quality of the software improves. The quality of the software improves. How else can the quality improve through the technical practices of free software? What are some other, other ways that it might improve? Well, free software projects compared to proprietary software projects. Um, would you ever be surprised if a proprietary software company put out an announcement about all of the bugs and the limitations of their software? You wouldn't expect them to. They don't announce what's wrong with their software. Right? In the free software world, do you expect that? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Why? Sorry? Because it's open. Right? Because it's open, but are they less proud of their work? Why, why, just because it's open, why, does it, why is it not surprising that people in the free software world are openly critical of their own work? So why people fix it? Yeah. There's somebody else who could fix it. Which yes. The ethic of transparency. People to come in and fix it, I think it's more than yeah. here's something for you to do. Yes, yes, that's very true. It's, it's also, there's a remarkable, um, sort of cultural um, theme that's grown up around free software of self-deprecation and self-criticism. And it's extremely healthy. Criticising your own work, openly saying what's, what's wrong with your work, is a very, very healthy way to be. Denying uh, there are any problems with your work um, tends to lead to the work not improving. Being honest about the quality of your own work tends to lead to that quality improving <coughs> over time. And that's a cultural theme in the free software community which tends to lead to better quality software. Okay? 
So anyway, there's lots of different things. As you're dealing with the free software community over the next few days, try to think about some of these themes and about the, the way you're interacting with the projects and how that is leading to higher quality software. You can't really lie about the quality of your work if it's open. Exactly, Whereas exactly. in a closed environment, you can easily tell the manager, yes, it's working, it's doing this. You've only got like... Right. Short 30 second update window that the moment right. it is. What would happen if you claimed your software was perfect <laughs> and this all source code was open? There's a common thing in Australia that the tall poppy syndrome. What's going to happen? Somebody's going to come and chop you down. Tall poppy syndrome. That applies in free software and generally in the software industry. If you claim your software is perfect, you're going to get your head block knocked off. Somebody will come along, there's a better programmer than you, and points out all the flaws. So you're better off starting off by saying it's not so perfect, right? In the free software, in the proprietary software world, a different theme tends to rise. People tend to claim that their software is the bee's knees, right? It's, it's, it's a rather strange and it's an interesting phenomenon. If you've ever installed Microsoft Windows, if you installed, say, XP and Vista and Windows 7, they all bring up the, it can do these remarkable things. Well, all those things that pops up while it's installing tend to be much the same about the previous one, but of course imply that all the previous claims were, were lies now, because now it says now it's great for the internet, but hang on, you claimed that two versions ago, right? So you get these sort of differences in, in themes, and it's, it's common across most of the proprietary software world. Not all proprietary software is like this. Some proprietary software does uh, self-criticise, and some free software does say, hey, we're fantastic, sometimes deliberately. Why, why would a free software project deliberately claim to be perfect? To attract that criticism. <laughs> to attract the criticism, to goad people. What's an example of that? What's an example that somebody's seen here of a free software project deliberately goading people into criticising the project? <clears throat> so this particular area of software, this tends to happen in. Security. Security, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well done. So the, it's quite common for somebody to say, hey, I reckon that you can't break into this operating system. And they put, they put a copy of the operating system up on the open internet. There's an example here in Australia where somebody has got a Linux box on the internet with the root password published on a web page. And a t-shirt. Right? Yep. And, and on his t-shirt. And on his t-shirt. I didn't know it was on a t-shirt as well. <laughs> okay, great. So he's got, now, he is then daring people to break into that box. But he's running something called SE Linux, which is a security enhanced version of Linux. That means that root doesn't have the same ability to destroy the box as it would in a normal machine. So he is making a strong claim. He's hoping that somebody will um, chop him down to size because that will then find a problem which will then be fixed. And it's better to find it on his box than in a production one. But it's, it's an interesting type of scenario. You don't tend to get that, that type of thing happening as much in the, in the proprietary software world. Okay, I say up there that some people see free software as the enemy. Who might see it as the enemy? Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft. Microsoft less so these days, but yes, traditionally Microsoft. Uh, many proprietary software companies see free software as the enemy. Um, business model, yeah, competes with. That's right. That's right. And they so, see other proprietary software as the enemy as well. There's often a question I'm asked when I tell people that I work on free software, and they say, you know, how on earth can you can you make a profit with that? How can you make money on free software? And the answer I give is, well, how are you going to make money competing with free software? If somebody else is making free software and you're trying to compete with it, how do you compete with zero price? Right? How do you compete with the open development model? And that's really what it comes down to. The free software community, it is perfectly plausible that free software will lead to overall less money being pouring into software um, development houses coffers. Right? People may end up paying less overall for free software, but for, for software in general. But it also means people are paying less for it and people are hopefully getting better software eventually. Uh, but some people don't like this. They like the status quo and they like the proprietary software model and some of them make extremely nasty comments and claims and things like the cancer claim about free software. If there's less money going into software development, does that mean there will be less developers required in the future? So they will... Well, the, one of the ideas is that software development becomes more efficient. Because we're sharing, there's less duplication of effort, yep. right? So the idea is that it becomes more efficient, which implies that either you end up with more and better software, or you end up with less programmers and less money. Both are possible, and in different areas of the software community, both are happening. Okay, so some see FOSS as just another type of software. 
And that's probably the majority. They just use it because it exists. Majority of people don't care about all the rest of the debates and just use it if it's there. All right? They like the fact that they pay less for it. That's great. Um, that's the, the mums and dads, uh, as they're called. That's most people see it like that. Okay, so you should think a bit about what FOSS is to you. Now this is a, a very uh, famous quote, um, and you should have seen it from the free software definition in the reading, uh, the background reading of this course. Um, free software is a matter of liberty, not price. To understand the concept, you should think of free as in free speech, not as in free beer. And um, that, you often see that um, free speech, not free beer, to shorten to that you know, short phrase um, in conversations on free software. And it's, it's important to understand that meme. And in some ways it's unfortunate the word free in English has this dual meaning. Um, and in fact, uh, some people call it Libra software, or might call it FLOSS, free Libra open source software, right? So Libra meaning of course is the word for freedom in French, I've probably pronounced it terribly, I don't know much French. Uh, but so some people use the word Libra to emphasise the free as in freedom aspect of free software. Um, it is important to keep that in mind. Um, usually, free software is available free as in free beer as well, but not always. Um, it is possible to charge for free software. In fact, that, that, that whole precedent was set by the Free Software Foundation when they first started releasing their software. They offered to sell people the tapes containing things like GCC and Emacs, right? On days, this is the days when mag tapes were used to distribute software, mag tapes in the post. Okay, was, that's how software tended to be distributed. So um, the Free Software Foundation sold mag tapes for about $150 a tape uh, to anyone who wanted a copy of the source code for one of these pieces of software. But they allowed anyone who received one of the tapes to copy it as much as they like and give it to other people, right? So you are allowed to charge for free software. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it, because the recipient is allowed to charge as well, and they're allowed to charge less, that tends to drive the price down. So the free beer aspect of free software tends to come about as a natural uh, result of economics, but it isn't actually built into the model at all. Okay, the four freedoms. These are the fundamental <coughs> freedoms that are written up on the Free Software Foundation's page as their defi definition of what free software is. Now all of you should have read those as part of the background reading. We'll just go through them very briefly. Um, but I, I should also mention that there weren't always four freedoms up there. There used to be two freedoms. All right, so let's try and work out which ones might have been added later. Um, the freedom to run the program for any purpose, freedom zero. What does that matter? Right. These these freedoms, you need to think of them in terms of being reactions to events of the past. Right? Because people have created licenses which in all aspects appear to be free, except they say you can only run the program for this purpose. Right? So the freedom to use it for any purpose. Is, is a very, very important one because otherwise you could end up that somebody takes your software, which is free, changes the license on it, and releases it under a different license that says that um, you may only use it for the following purpose. And with narrow enough restrictions on purpose, you can make the software pretty much useless. You can make sure that no one else can use it. And that has happened. Right? Companies have put out, individuals have put out uh, software with licenses like that. There's a lot of academic and non commercial. Style yep, that's right, that's right. Let's say, in fact, the very first license I used on Samba, uh, I'll be showing that during the case study Samba lecture later in the week, um, falls in this category. Um, before I understood how free software works, this was back in 1991, um, I made up my own license. Very common to do in those days. It was like three lines, very simple license, and it had a restriction on it, right? That wouldn't have met these basic freedoms. Okay, so extremely common. Um, the freedom to study how the program works, adapt it to your needs, um, and adapt it to your needs. Now, that's basically the ability to see the source code. And notice that it's the freedom to study and adapt it. Access the source code is a precondition to that, but it's not necessarily sufficient. Right? There might be other ways of restricting the software so you get the source code but you can't study it. And I have actually seen licenses like that, where they have DRM systems you can only view one page at a time, or 
you can only view it in, you know, if you're sitting in a particular locked room or this sort of thing. Um, it doesn't give you the real freedom to study how the program works and adapt it. So that's an extremely important freedom. You must be able to improve the program. Okay, the next freedom. The freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbour. And that's the fundamental theme, the helping your neighbour, right, that is uh, one of the driving ethical, uh, ethical drivers behind free software. Right? So everyone has to be able to give copies to other people so you can help your neighbour. Uh, they don't have to be just your neighbour. Your neighbour is in the very broad sense. It doesn't have to be somebody who's actually living next door to you. Uh, freedom to improve the program and release your improvements uh, and modify versions in general to the public so that the whole community benefits. Okay. Now this gets interesting because there are quite a few projects that are considered free and open source software that have some twists on this. There are some, for example, that say you can only release the, you can't release modified versions, but you can release patches separately. Uh, so um, differences between the program and what and uh, what you what you, you want the software to be, but you can't modify the core software itself. And there's been a lot of discussions and controversy over the years as to whether that should be allowed or not. And there is some quite major software that um, has license conditions that falls in that category where you, can, you can't modify the base software, you can only distribute patches. Okay, so they're the basic definitions um, of what, what Richard called free software. Let's um, coming back once again to the rights of the author. Yes. That by saying you can't modify that, it's trying to maintain the rights of the author because I could take an open source package, yes. change what the GUI looks like, get rid of Firefox in the corner and change it to something else and just re-release it. That's right, that's right. So. Um, that's hitting on a, on a common theme in, in the free software world, which is the, um, you must give credit to people who develop a particular piece of code, but you must also take the blame for a piece of code. So if I release a piece of software, then you download it and improve it and release it again, you need to make it clear that you made the modifications. And you often see the, uh, a disclaimer on the page saying, all bugs are my responsibility, you know, I have modified this software, or this software has been modified by whoever, and making sure you take the blame, because you don't want the original author to take the blame for changes made by somebody else. Right? That's a very important theme. It isn't always enforced in the license, but it is in the culture. It's very deeply in the culture. And modifying a piece of software and not making it clear that it is modified from the original author is a taboo. Sometimes it's actually forbidden in the license. The license ha requires you to state that you've uh, made the changes. In other cases, it's just part of a cultural taboo. Okay? So, let's move on to the open source definition. Now, the open source definition, um, this sprung out of, well, there's been different, different explanations of how it is sprung up, but, but basically, the word free, um, that duality of the meaning of the word free was thought to be causing confusion in the free and open source software world. So a new term was coined um, quite late in the movement. Uh, it wasn't coined until um, the late 90s, I think, or mid to late 90s, I've forgotten the exact date. Um, and this new term was called open source, and they, um, uh, they created something called the open source definition, which was based upon the Debian free software guidelines, uh, which came from the Debian project, one of a Linux distribution. And the open source definition provides a definition for what open source is, which is similar in many ways to the four freedoms of free software, but has a different emphasis. And we're running a little low on time, so I'll just, I'll just look at it just briefly up here. We have a look at the open source definition here, but we won't go through it in quite as much detail, perhaps. If you have a look through the open source definition here, hopefully you've all had a look at it since um, from, from the background reading material, then each of these terms maps fairly closely onto a concept in those four freedoms from free software, but there are some differences, and the precise wording is extremely important. Um, if we have a look at, say, let's um, look at this first one. The license shall not restrict any party from selling or giving away the software as a component of an aggregate software distribution. Right, um, so it, and then it goes on to say the license shall not require a royalty or other fee from such sale. So it doesn't um, require a royalty, um, but it doesn't. It doesn't say that you are not allowed to charge.
but it, you're allowed to charge money for the software, but somebody who receives it doesn't, isn't required to give you back a royalty. They can license it, they can give it to other people without paying you, right? even though you might have charged them for the initial copy. Okay, and um, so the program must include source code and must allow distribution of in source code as well as in compiled form. So, um, and when it's when some form of the product is not distributed with source code, there must be a well publicised means of obtaining the source code. This is ensuring that there is a way of getting the source code, but it's allowing them to provide the source code via, for example, a website, right? Not necessarily coming with the product. So. A lot of the, the terms in this open source definition are, like the free software definition, are reactions to events in the history of the FOSS movement. And where somebody has come up with a very strange license, and that license, everyone's then thought, that shouldn't be allowed, right? And a new term has been added to the open source definition, it's evolved over time. Similarly, the free software definition from the FSF started off with two clauses, ended up with four, basically as a reaction to people who found ways to game the system, to avoid the underlying imperatives of what was trying to be achieved while still meeting the letter of the rules. Right? And so licenses tend to evolve over time, they're not static. So the, the very definition of free software evolves over time. Okay, so uh, how big is FOSS? Well, um, hopefully you've, you've started looking at what projects you might want to work on. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of free software projects out there, right? But many of them are projects that are defunct. Uh, somebody put it up one weekend after they've had a bit too much to drink, and uh, they had this idea that they were going to recreate the latest you know, game or whatever, then they never worked on it again. So it is rather hard to measure exactly how many projects there are. As many of you might have found when trying to find a project for this course, well, you might find a project that looks appealing and then you found it hasn't been worked on for 10 years. Right? So really it's a number of active projects that might be more important. But in general there's, there's certainly tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of projects. A typical uh, Linux distribution uh, might have available for it of the order of 10,000 odd projects. Uh, packages that actually come with the distribution or are, are available uh, for direct download uh, and are integrated with the distribution. Um, there's about 230,000 projects registered on one site SourceForge. There's something like 50,000 odd on Savannah the last time I looked. Um, there's a lot of projects out there. Some projects are registered on more than one site, so of course you can get a little bit of double counting as well. Okay, similar number of developers. How many developers do you think there are? Thousands? Um, hundreds of thousands? There's probably a similar number of developers to there are projects. Some developers work on more than one project. Right. I've got about 20 odd projects um, that I've uh, worked on over the years, uh, maybe a little more. And uh, so, but some developers tend to work on just one project. The majority of FOSS developers tend to just work on one project, I'd say. Um, so, and yet some people who, um, uh, some, some projects of course have many developers on the, on the one project. In fact, there's some projects that have hundreds or even thousands of developers working on them. Um, although thousands is, is quite unusual, there's one, only a very few examples of that. So it's a little bit hard again to estimate the number of developers, but it's probably in the hundreds of thousands. Okay, so how many people, how many users of free software are there? And again, this is very hard to pin down. It depends what you're trying to, to get at as to which way you choose to count it. Um, because what is a user? I mean, if you use the internet, you're a user of free software in a way, because free software usually runs the routers and the mail servers and uh, the computers you're talking to, the servers you're talking to. So in some ways you're using FOSS. If you've got a phone, uh, many phones these days are based on Linux, uh, many little PDAs are based on Linux, little GPS devices, that little ebook reader, so lots of people are FOSS users. Um, but there are other people who might run a complete FOSS operating system as their desktop operating system. And that's probably millions of people, uh, but again it's very hard to count. Okay, so what types of products? Um, FOSS isn't just for servers and desktops. Um, a lot of people in the media just talk about FOSS in terms of Linux on the desktop as being what free and open source software is all about. In fact, FOSS only has a fairly small penetration into the desktop market. There's a much bigger market out there which is the embedded market, and I've mentioned a lot of embedded devices before. Within the embedded market, free software now dominates. 
Now it didn't, when I started working on FOSS, I, I started on about 1989 or so, uh, 20 years ago, and at the time, free software was not used very much at all in the embedded market. Um, hardly anything. It was dominated by a few real-time operating system companies, and um, all these little devices tend to have these little RTOSs, real-time operating systems, built into them, proprietary, pay a fee per copy. In that, in that time, over the past 10, 15 years, um, embedded, the whole embedded software market has switched over to using free software, or a very large part of it. Um, something like 70 or 80 percent of the market is now based on free operating systems, and it's, it's growing very rapidly. Similar in high performance computing. When I started out doing work in high performance computing, it was completely dominated by proprietary software. Things like the CM5 uh, with their uh, CMOS operating system and other you know, similar uh, proprietary systems. Um, these days, high performance computing is completely dominated by free software. Uh, it tends to be free software operating systems that just dominates it. So you can get remarkable changes. A lot of people have been predicting over the years that eventually free software will take a large share of the desktop operating system market. It hasn't yet, but you can expect pretty much every year there will be announcement that this next year is going to be the year of uh, the Linux desktop. And that's an annual announcement that tends to come out from somebody. And eventually one of those might be right. Who knows? The embedded device market, because of the, the hardware angle, the yep. traditional business model still works. They can sell the Exactly, hardware. exactly. That's why right. it fits extremely well, which is why it got done so quickly. We're still in the desktop market, we've got such a generic PC that yep. it's sort of the business model hasn't been able to... Yes, I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons why maybe it hasn't um, uh, taken off as much in the desktop market. There's lots of people who argue as to why it hasn't. It hasn't. Um, it is, um, it is a very long debate. It certainly it hasn't dominated yet. Within some segments of the desktop market, it's gaining a lot of uh, usage. Uh, for example, if you include the uh, netbook PCs, then sort of last year people were saying that Linux has a large uh, part of the netbook PC market. And last week Microsoft claimed they, they now have 96% of the netbook market, which is a remarkable change in one year, depending on if they're counting it in the right way. Heaven knows. Um, if you include the, even the things like the OLPC, the One Love to Per Child project, which has put out millions of computers being used by people in um, less well-off countries in particular, if that counts as being desktop, that in inflates the desktop percentages enormously. So again, it depends how you count it, right, as to whether it's um, uh, made a big impact in the desktop market. Um, okay, so it's certainly, it's big anyway. It's a quite a large part of the, free, of the overall software industry now. So this is a little comment that I saw while making up these, uh, writing down these lectures, and I thought you might like to have a look at it, because it's, uh, it really sums things up in the um, Linux, Mac OS, Windows argument. Not all of you can read it, I'll just read it out. See, this is what I love about Windows. Things just work, and the Windows user just tapping away at his Windows box. Then the, uh, I plugged in my router and bingo, I have a web connection. This is what people want. Uh, does he know, then there's a comment, uh, does he know that it's that easy on a Mac too? There's the Mac user, then the Linux user sells him, should I tell him the router runs on Linux? Um, so, and it's, I think it sums things up quite nicely. But I'd also like to point out something else that's in the bottom right hand corner of this comment. Right? Anyone read that? It says, copyright 2008, Ryan Cartwright, CC by NCSA. Anyone know what that means? It's a Creative Commons license. Creative Commons license. Right? It's copyright a particular individual, and he's released that comic under a Creative Commons, um, and it's a particular type of Creative Commons license that requires attribution, that's the by, NC non-commercial, and um, share-alike, so a share-alike license. Right? So in other words, it has to be released under a similar license, a compatible license to this one. And in fact, if you look at the start of these lectures, you'll notice that this lecture itself is released under a Creative Commons license. Little symbol down the bottom there. Right? All of these lectures are released under a free license. So Creative Commons, I thought I'd point out to you, is free software applied more generally to um, works, uh, copyrightable works, not just to software. Okay, like lectures can be released under a license that is inspired by the free software world, including that comic was released under that. And there's an awful lot of Creative Commons material. The amount of material may even be larger than the amount of free software that's out there. But it's, it's worth mentioning because it's um, quite a strong movement. Okay, the FOSS community. So, um, 
To develop a community, each FOSS project tends to develop its own subculture, uh, which means that all the stuff I tell you about the culture of FOSS may be different in a particular community. What does that mean as far as if you, one of you is going to be involved in a new project? What do you need to do? Understand the culture. Understand the culture of the project you're getting involved with. You have, how do you do that? How do you find out how the culture works for a particular project? Register yourself on the mailing, mailing list? Yep, that's right. Reading on the mailing list, reading the website, observing other people interacting. Because those interactions tend to happen out in the open, right? There may even be something on the website that explains their culture, explains the rules of their particular project, explains the norms of behaviour that they expect. Right? And it can vary quite, quite dramatically between different projects. So it's worth finding out whether your particular project that you want to get involved with has some twists on these cultural norms. But there's a lot of common themes uh, between these, these different development communities. Some of them tend to have, or nearly all of them have a strong leaning towards meritocracy. What is meritocracy? Oh, I must have heard of it. Acknowledgement of the people who have the skills. Yeah. More than just acknowledgement, that's not just credit. It's a leadership system not based on voting, but based on merit. That's right, a leadership system based on merit. And the free software community tends to be strongly leaning towards a meritocracy type system. Not all free software projects are a meritocracy, but it, they tend to lean that way. Uh, some, some of them have stronger voting systems, they have boards, and they have uh, managing directors and all this sort of thing. But when members of things like a steering committee for a project are selected, it's usually based on technical merit. Right? It's usually based on what contributions they have made to the project and what technical knowledge they have about the field of endeavour that the project deals with. If it's a compiler project, it tends to be experts in compilers. Um, now, that is a little bit different from the, um, uh, the corporate world, the sort of proprietary software world, where you commonly get managers who aren't programmers. You commonly get managers who don't understand the, the individual lines of code of the project. That's normal, right, in the private software world. In the free software world, it's not. It tends to be that the people who are running the project, who are making decisions on behalf of the project, tends to be those who know the most about the project. And very often, it's the people who lead the project who make the biggest contributions, who do most of the coding. Whereas in the proprietary software world, it tends to be that the people at the top do the least work in terms of actually writing, creating the product. The people at the bottom tends to be the ones that do most of the work. Right? It's inverted in the free software world. It tends to be that the people who make the decisions are the ones who do most of the work. Now that has some consequences as far as software quality is concerned. Because it means the decisions about the project tend to be much more closely aligned with the actual technology and the, and the, or the way the code works. Okay. Um, the right to fork, but the reluctance to fork. And this is a, a nice little contradiction. Um, the right to fork, in fact, you could say that the right to fork a project um, is a defining factor of free software, right, and open source software. What is forking a project? What does it mean? It, it doesn't mean taking a stick, you know, fork stick and going poke poke. Right? What does it mean to fork a, 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 a software project? Sorry? Sharing it with somebody more than just sharing it. Take the development of the source in a different direction. Right. Take your own, take a copy of the software, then create a new project. Right? And that new project might be going in a different direction under new leadership and have different aims than the original software. Why is it called a fork? Yes, but why in particular is it called a fork? What, where does the name fork come from? Version control systems. Version control systems, even before that, I think. Timeline 2, you've got one and a two. Branches no, in the tree. tree. Yeah, I, I think it probably originally came from the fork system call in Unix. Uh, I'm not sure, I haven't looked up the history of it, but I'm pretty sure it comes from, in, in the Unix operating system, there is a system call called fork, right? And that takes a process, right? Clones the process, makes an exact copy, right? And then both processes then continue running and evolve separately, all right? That's the way, when you run a program, every time you run a program on a Unix system, it, everyone is a child of init. There's this init process, then everything forks off that, and then after they're forked, they then start doing different things. But they're all forked off the original. There's like a tree of processes in a Unix-type system. 
and uh, I'm pretty sure this comes from Unix um, uh, history, and uh, that's where the name fork comes from, to fork a project. It's like cloning the project, and so it's the same at the beginning, then it goes in different directions. Okay, so why is the right to fork important? So if you don't disagree with um, it, it seems like you can go and create your own version like with OpenOffice. Yeah. It's go uh, um, because That's right. There's a, there's a, also yep. quite a symphony, but I'm not sure um, what kind of license that's actually under. I don't know, actually. It's I because it's uh, based on OpenOffice. Yes, I it believe it is, but I don't know what the license is. Yeah, you, you, could, you could look it up and try and find out. I'm yeah. not sure what my sense is. No, I, I don't know. It's I don't know. GPL. Yep, yep. Okay, so the right to fork, but why is the right to fork important? Why is it, if I'm a user of a free software project, why should I care as a user of that project that I have the right to fork that project? It's not free software. Yeah, but that's sort of self free that's a circular argument. Yeah, no. why, why is it important that that aspect of free software be, be true? You end up with very static lines of development that, that can't really expand in terms of their capabilities and directions. Yeah, I'm looking for something a little bit different. And what I'm looking Ooh. for is, is about...